The School of Electrical Engineering and Telecommunications is home to around 5,000 square metres of dedicated teaching labs and more than 2,000 square metres of research labs. The Electrical Engineering Building was refurbished in 2019 at a cost of $104 million. It's home to 18 specialised teaching laboratories, the latest of which is the Quantum Engineering Teaching Laboratory. Our five electronics teaching laboratories, which can simultaneously accommodate around 250 students, are linked via an audio-visual system that allows one lecturer to broadcast a presentation to students in all labs. Our new advanced design laboratory has flexible benching and enormous articulated doors, giving space for robots, uh, for electronic car projects or for design test rigs. Since last accreditation, more than $10 million of new equipment used in teaching has been purchased, and a new maker space has been installed in the building with hands-on support for students to design and mill their own PCBs and do their own soldering. Our 15 highly skilled technical and professional officers are passionate about student learning and go to extraordinary lengths to support it. The physical lab experience is also supported by dozens of hours of beautiful quality preparatory videos, the result of a quarter of a million dollars of innovative project funding. The school also has more than 37 specialised research laboratories across three buildings, all of which are available to honours students and master's project students. Whether, students, whether projects involve uh, computer vision control of flying drones, manufacturing new optical fibres, acoustic testing in anechoic chambers, designing and testing communications hardware for satellites, voltages up to 400 kV, simulating and building microgrids, testing commercial scale vanadium batteries, or fabricating quantum devices at the Australian Nanofabrication Facility, we have what students need. Students can choose to do their projects with one of our seven spin-out companies or with external industry. We also have a learning and teaching innovation lab that's dedicated for staff to experiment with the latest equipment, software and delivery methods. Outside of the curriculum, our students have put a satellite into space, won the National Instruments Autonomous Robotics Competition, built an omnidirectional robotic lounge, and won the IEEE Signal Processing Cup with a beat tracking robotic drum kit, all here in these facilities. During COVID, most of our hardware focused labs have been re equipped to teach remotely, as you'll see, supported by in house custom designed circuit boards and many new web enabled oscilloscopes and other equipment. This brings student learning at, in the lab as close as possible to actually being at the bench. We're sorry that an in person tour isn't possible, but we hope this video will give a brief glimpse into laboratory learning for electrical engineering, telecommunications, and quantum engineering. Welcome to Electronics and Electrical Circuits Remote Lab. The Remote Lab supports four courses, two electronics and two electrical circuit courses. Each course has 12 dedicated Remote Lab setup. Students are working in pairs and 24 students can be accommodated at any given time per course. Two courses can run concurrently. This brings up the capacity of the remote lab to 48 students per session. At present, analog electronic second year course is running remotely. As we speak, 24 students are working remotely in this lab from the comfort of their home in a COVID safe manner. Due to the current restriction in Sydney, all electronics lab are now running remotely and the remote lab is supporting more than 160 students enrolled in the course. I will now introduce you to the Analog Electronics Remote Lab, proudly ours, designed and built in the school. Central to the remote lab is remotely accessed uh, reconfigurable board. The board allows students to set up their circuit remotely for measurement. The particular electronic circuit the students are working at the moment is a two-stage amplifier with a feedback. The board allows them to configure the amplifier as a single stage, a two-stage, and allows them to add a feedback network to modify the feedback network, reconfigure the circuit to measure current, and to select a particular mode for voltage measurement. Generally, 
the board allows them to set up their design circuit remotely for measurement as they would do if they were in the lab in person. The second important aspect of the remote setup is the digital oscilloscope with integrated signal generator and a multimeter that the students can access remotely and operate the oscilloscope and the signal generator. They can set up the amplitude and the frequency of the input signal. They can view and measure the input and output signals. They can perform AC and DC measurements. Generally, they can conduct all measurements they would normally do if they were physically in the lab. The communication side of the remote lab is based on Microsoft Teams. The Microsoft team allows students to join the particular lab, allows them to interact with each other, allows them to interact with the lab demo, allows them to have access to the lab computer so that they can operate the reconfigurable hardware and the digital oscilloscope. Uh, it allows them to be marked or assessed individually as well. All in all, the MSTEM allows them to have uh, laboratory experience uh, that they would have uh, if they were physically in the lab. Now, uh, can you please change? I'll ask the student to change the input signal. Can you change the input signal? The amplitude of the input signal to 50. Can you change the frequency to 5 kilohertz? So, in isolation, you could look at that and say, oh, cool, let's use 100 MC for R3. Sorry, let's use words, can you? Uh, can you? In practice, why would that not work? Can you tell me what's the gain of the amplifier? It's just normal capacitor, and there's only one capacitor in this entire circuit, right? Okay, cool. So it's just one. Yes, yes, yes. So Seventy. Well, it's, it's a dominant focus. Yeah. Gain. So the gain is seventy, which is close to the designed value, which is good. Uh, now, can I ask you to reconfigure it as a single stage? Yes, very much this. Can you give me a few issues, like how it can affect it? No, you can't see much. Yep. And the gain now becomes uh, 20, 20, you know, the second stage. So you need the second, the, 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 so the first stage. Yeah, okay, good. I'm Digital Simulation Laboratory. What we have here is Australia's largest real-time simulation facility. It has been a facility that for many years has been dedicated to the research we do on power electronics and power system uh, operation and control. And for the last couple of years, we have also introduced uh, courses and educational material for our undergraduate and postgraduate students, as well as our thesis students who want to work in the real-time simulation laboratory. In terms of uh, facilities that we have in our lab, of course we have our RTDS simulator. This is an 18-rack real-time digital simulator. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the largest real-time simulator in terms of capacity uh, in Australia. The function of a real-time simulator is to allow us to model and simulate and interact in real time with our simulations. So we're able to learn, run very large system models for power electronics and power systems. And we are also, since the whole system is running in real time, able to interface with hardware and do tests uh, in the loop. So we're able to test control systems. We're able to test protection systems. We're able to test uh, power components. 
with a simulation that allows us to get a lot more realistic results and a lot more uh, results that reflect the actual operation of a system in real life. The size of the real-time simulation facility in uh, UNSW allows us to run very large, very detailed uh, system simulations. However, the modular structure of the real-time simulator allows us to also utilize its functions for our teaching purposes. So the, the facilities we have, which include this 18-rack simulator, can be used as a single module of simulation. And what this allows us is to run courses, such as our real-time simulations course, that each of the students or each of the groups that are working in real-time simulation get a dedicated use of one of these uh, pieces of equipment, and they are able to model, build, and interact with their own models, their own simulations, and um, develop their skills that integrate their power electronics, their power system, and effectively all the knowledge they have gained throughout the whole electrical engineering curriculum and bring it together in a quite involved, uh, hands-on experience in the lab. Examples of what we can do with a real-time simulator that includes uh, courses uh, or parts of the course that we run, also parts of the tasks that the students need to complete in a real-time simulation course would include uh, power system modeling, uh, development of uh, well, stability analysis of power systems, integration of renewables of power systems, uh, high voltage DC transmission, uh, large network simulations, and so on. It gives us uh, very large flexibility and uh, variability in the specific cases that we want uh, to experiment with the student. Our lab includes uh, more than one uh, technologies of real-time simulators. We also have, uh, besides the real-time, the RTDS real-time simulator, we have Opal RT real-time simulators, and that allows us to cover a lot more, a broader range of applications, but also of approaches to real-time uh, simulation. Uh, examples of what we can do with uh, the Opal RT simulator would be control hardware in the loop testing with, uh, for example, our three megawatt solar PV inverter controller that the students can uh, test together with a representation of a power system that is running in a, our power system simulator here. Or they can get hands-on experience with modeling power electronics with uh, small real-time simulators that they would have dedicated for the research project, for their uh, teaching project. Uh, or other examples would be the development of uh, controller for power electronics in a small system. Uh, by using multiple small simulators, we're able to give each student or each group, again, uh, a dedicated access to the facility and a dedicated access to a specific equipment that can be used for uh, throughout the whole term and throughout the whole course. So we do not have to compete over resources uh, within the lab. And beyond our, uh, the courses that we run in the real-time simulator, of course, our students have access to the real-time simulation facilities for their uh, thesis projects, either in an undergraduate or a postgraduate environment. So this allows them to spend a whole year contributing to our research projects or running their own uh, thesis projects uh, using state-of-the-art equipment and uh, developing new solutions for the power electronics and power systems of the future. Hello, my name is Dr. Arne Laucht and I'm one of the senior lecturers here in the School of Electrical Engineering and Telecommunications. Last year, the school has launched a new quantum engineering degree, a bachelor degree, which is the first of its kind in the whole world. As part of that degree, we have a number of quantum courses that we are running here at the university, including more fundamental quantum mechanics courses, advanced quantum mechanics, quantum communication, advanced communication, and quantum control. For one of these courses, for the Advanced Quantum Computation course, we have built this teaching lab setup. This allows students, undergraduate students, as part of their degree, get hands-on experience in how to control a quantum system. Demonstrating quantum effects in a teaching lab environment in normal ambient light, in normal atmosphere and at room temperature can be quite a challenge because all the effects of the environment have an influence on the quantum system. 
quantum systems are very fragile, they interact with the environment and that destroys the quantum nature. To do that, we had to translate our research into a teaching lab laboratory. The hard piece of that experiment is a little piece of diamond that is sitting down here. Inside the diamond is what is called a color center, a nitrogen vacancy center that has a spin and that can be optically addressed and read out. For that, we need a laser. There's a green laser here, fiber coupled, that then gets, comes out here and goes via a mirror through a microscope objective and gets focused on the piece of diamond. The emission, the light emission from the diamond gets collected with another fiber and goes to a photodetector and inside a lock and amplifier. In addition to that, we have a microwave source that via this cable here and a little printed circuit board antenna delivers, micro delivers microwaves to the diamond piece to initiate spin rotations of the nitrogen vacancy center. The concepts of these labs are already taught in the lectures, but there's a lot of technical knowledge that the students need to know to be able to run these experiments with the specific quantum system, the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond, and the specific electronics. To get them a little bit started and to get them to think about it more before they come to the lab, we have preparatory quizzes in Moodle that are integrated to teach them a few of the concepts and to get them to think about some of these concepts before they appear in class. We also have um, mini lectures that were recorded last year for remote delivery so that the students can again hear some of the explanations before they come to the lab. In the lab the students then use a MATLAB code inside the computer to interface with the instruments and to program the sequences that are required for doing the measurements. So the code, this is an example code of one of these experiments where they have to set up the different experiments, the um, lock and amplifier, the microwave source and also a voltage source that allows us to control the DC magnetic field that these spins are experiencing. The students write and add to that code so that they can control the instruments and run the experiments. And then, as an example for it, they can get results like this one. So this is the spin resonance spectrum of that NV center in diamond at a small magnetic field. And you can see three peaks here. The three peaks actually come from the hyperfine coupling of the electron spin of that NV center with the nitrogen-14 nuclear spin. One of the exercises is to look at these three peaks and get an idea how different excitation powers of the microwave source lead to power broadening of the spectrum, how you can get a sharper line if you use less power. Another experiment, and that now goes towards the uh, realm of quantum, is to use um, a short microwave pulse to start rotating that spin. We initialize the spin in a spin down state and by applying a short microwave pulse we can rotate a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more when we make that pulse longer and longer and longer. And this is what we call a Rabi oscillation or Rabi rotation when the spin gets rotated from spin down to spin up. When it is in the middle then it's in a superposition state between spin up and spin down one of the fundamental effects in quantum mechanics. This one here where you can see when the spin is subject to a longer and longer microwave pulse plotted here on the x-axis, it rotates more and more and more. At this point it's completely up and then when you make the pulse longer and longer and longer it rotates back into a spin down state here going into that trough. The amplitude of the oscillations decreases because we have decoherence in the system. And that relates to what I was saying earlier, that any effect from the environment has an effect on the quantum system and destroys the valuable coherence that we have. Overall, these experiments give the students a very good idea of how a quantum experiment has to be set up, calibrated, tuned up, and to relate the concepts from the lecture to hands-on experiments here in the lab. And it also shows the difficulty and the challenges that there are 
in building a quantum computer, in taking a quantum system and actually doing something very controlled with it, like Rabi oscillations or more complex, complex pulse sequences.